I will talk about limits and practical usability of uh, BSDs from the big data perspective. Uh, my name is Frederick Ponoševac. I uh, work at the Carnegie Mellon University uh, uh, robotics department, uh, uh, and I work for the Auton Lab. Uh, people who are of uh, British descent will probably uh, recognize that Auton has to do something with the science fiction series. Uh, Doctor Who. Indeed, that's uh, all the team in the lab is from Doctor Who. Uh, the Auton Lab uh, started about 23 years ago uh, by several, at that time, young uh, computer scientists. Uh, one of them was Andrew Moore, who is now the dean of uh, School of Computer Science. Uh, another one was Jeff Schneider. Uh, Jeff is currently chief technology officer at Uber. Uh, he's on leave of absence from us. He's full research professor. Uh, and the lab is uh, currently led by Dr. Artur Dubravsky, uh, who is of Polish descent. Okay. Uh, before we go any further, I would like to thank you organizers for inviting me. Uh, this is my first BSD con conference, and I felt like a child in the candy store being able to see all these people whom I know from, the, from online. Uh, uh, so who, who am I? Uh, uh, what is Auton Lab? Uh, why don't we use uh, uh, computing facilities of uh, School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon? Uh, and how did I find myself in uh, this mess? So there are several oops, uh, questions that people might ask, uh, might ask at the beginning and that I will try uh, to answer. Uh, I said my name. Uh, in real life, I'm a research-trained mathematician. I still want to think of myself as somebody who is writing papers. Uh, and on a good day with all BSDs and all my machines work, you can find me in the library uh, uh, working on semi-classical limits in quantum mechanics. You can also find me working on uh, uh, combinatorial problems in matrix theory that, uh, that lie in the foundations of computer science that my colleagues are trying to uh, 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 you use. Uh, uh, in their machine learning algorithms. In particular, lately I was hacking on, a, I was playing with a, a Bentley algorithm for a high, very high dimensions. Uh, I said, what is the Autolab? So Autolab is statistical uh, data mining machine learning group. Uh, uh, and historically it started 23 years ago, not just because Andrew Moore, Jeff Schneider, and Arthur Dubravsky uh, wanted to, to have uh, something on their own, but uh, the principal reason was that at that time, 64-bit computing was not supported by the School of Computer Science. So they wanted to, to do 64-bit computing. Uh, that was the originally historical reason for, 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 for starting separate uh, uh, computing infrastructure. Uh, ever since then, 20 years, uh, we have an easy, sort of uneasy relationship I'm semi-jokingly with the people from the uh, IT Infrastructure School of Computer Science, and we, may, we treat them as a hostile network. Uh, how did I find myself, you know, when I said I'm a research mathematician, how do I find myself as playing now with the BSDs? Uh, well, I've been a long-time Unix user, and particularly I would refer to myself as a BSD hobbyist for over 10 years prior to uh, coming there, mostly using OpenBSD at, at, at home. And uh, uh, during this uh, budgetary crisis times down at University System of Georgia around 2011, 2012, somebody had this great idea to start merging various colleges. So I found my, my institution merging with the Medical College of Georgia, which, which I found completely misplaced. I mean, uh, so I start poking, and these people were crazy enough to uh, believe me that I can manage a bunch of machines. Uh, and so that's how I found myself at Autolab. Uh, origins of BSDs in Autolab. Uh, I have found some forensic evidence that uh, BSDs were used in the past, in particular free BSD, maybe 10, 15 years ago. But when I moved, there was not a single machine running any flavor of BSD. Uh, uh, so naturally, since I, I knew something about BSD and I had this foolish, uh, foolish assumption that as a hobbyist, I can actually manage a bunch of machines for other people, and let's say the number of machines. Uh, so number of my servers, I have about 40 servers at any given point. 
35 to 40 servers. I have 20 desktops and I have a bunch of virtual machines and uh, jail, jail, jail host. Uh, 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 in the terms of the, the data, I have anywhere between 200 and 250 terabytes of data at any given moment. Uh, about 60 accounts, uh, I have about 60 active user accounts at any given point, uh, consisting of uh, my core faculty, graduate students. We have 26 PhD students at this time. Uh, we have a full-time, uh, both researchers and full-time scientific programmers who work, work for us. For us. Uh, so as I said, at the time when I moved to Autolab, there was uh, only forensic evidence. I had a storage room that, that had all sorts of machines, even from early 90s. One of the most beautiful of those ended up actually in the, uh, in the computer club. And I naturally start to infuse some BSDs. Uh, so essentially, the way that I, as a hobbyist, I saw always BSDs, there, are, there were sort of two, two branches. If you are coming from NetBSD camp, essentially this is pro probably your uh, Unix chronology. You start with Ken Thompson, Bill Joy, blah, 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 NetBSD, and then key point is when TOD RAT forks uh, open BSD. If you're coming from a, a free BSD side of, uh, of the story, uh, probably you're gonna think highly about William Jolit's uh, release of uh, BSD 386. Uh, you have FreeBSD, and then another key point uh, is uh, Matt Dillon forking Dragonfly BSD. Uh, and there is a, an interesting uh, genealogy tree, which I shamelessly stole from the NetBSD uh, website. Uh, I have pretty much, in all these years, I have tried, uh, I would not say uh, all, all pseudo forks and all key, key turn appliances, but in, in, in all these years, I have actually, honest to God, tried to use all four major uh, BSD uh, operating system, NetBSD, uh, OpenBSD, FreeBSD, Dragonfly BSD, uh, and I have also experience with several turnkey appliances. Uh, actually, at this point, I, I, I was thinking of telling you a little bit about the general limitations of all these BSDs uh, in academic environment, what I found as a sort of a general limitation. And then after that, I will actually let you uh, uh, basically pick my brain and pick up any of the BSDs that you particularly like, and maybe I can say something how we use it or why we don't use it uh, and how it's useful to us. So uh, I work in this scientific computing environment, uh, which, which means that people, are, it's a playground. Let's, let's, let's think in that way. Uh, and uh, when, you, when you're in the playground, uh, uh, you play with lots of different things, right? Uh, some of these things, unfortunately, are proprietary. And first in general, limit, first limitation of BSDs uh, is the lack of uh, vendor support, uh, both uh, hardware and software vendor support. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, NVIDIA currently does not release uh, CUDA drivers for, uh, for GPU, so GPU is impossible. Uh, Unlike many other lab, labs at the Carnegie Mellon University, we did not take the plunge into the GPU based upon PR statements coming out of NVIDIA. Uh, that was actually a very long process that, start, that uh, lasted for several years before few people from the, who were, who were doing uh, some uh, vision, uh, vision data analyzing for us uh, basically convinced us that there are certain algorithms, certain classes algorithms that are useful for, for which GPU computing is useful. So it is not like somebody woke up over the night, saw uh, newspaper headlines, and decided, oh, we're going to use GPU. So it was much more serious than that. We take our resources very seriously. Uh, and to say something in that respect, uh, somebody would walk in and stuff. I had a graduate students who were ad advocating several years ago uh, that they would like to have GPUs, and they would say, ah, I can hack a little bit for free. And I said, what do you mean for free? Your tuition, uh, scholarship, uh, uh, money that we pay actually adds up to more than my salary. So our PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University cost about $90,000 a year. 
So there is not such a thing as a free, and the most expensive thing is a, is a human time, so we, we actually take uh, this very seriously. Uh, second bullet talks about lack of proprietary compilers. In any given moment, we might or might not use proprietary uh, compilers or other software. Uh, uh, we might not even have a real need, and I will say something on, on, uh, on the next slide how that works. Uh, another typical software that, that we use in an uh, academic environment is a MATLAB. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, in my experience, I have to say that MATLAB is typically a first programming language that many students have actually uh, encountered. This, is, this was really shocking for me, uh, uh, and uh, in particular, less technical students, and we have students coming with a business background, a public policy background. Actually, one of our faculty is at Heinz School of, of Business, and he has obviously all these people, all these students, PhD students, you know, uh, who, will be, be, who will be policy makers who are doing some data, data science, uh, be, uh, large data science. Typically, their default mode is MATLAB. And when I say MATLAB, I'm not ignorant. I'm aware of the, uh, obviously, of, uh, of uh, free, uh, free alternatives. Uh, uh, those free, free alternatives, unfortunately, typically, uh, basically, uh, just replace the core functionality of MATLAB. Uh, most, of, uh, most of the power is actually in the toolboxes. Uh, they're very expensive. Uh, if you ask me privately what I think about MATLAB, I would say, Unless 90% of what you're trying to prototype is already in there, don't, don't do it, you know. But I have to have it for the students. Uh, general computer algebra system, Mathematica. Uh, I'm a big fan of Ma Maximus and Maxima. Uh, I know the whole story of, uh, of, of, of general computing algebra programs. I actually have a friends who work uh, on very specialized computer algebra programs like a gap for uh, computational group theory. But when it comes to a general uh, computing algebra program, uh, computational algebra, uh, typically mathematics is the first thing that a math, math physics st student would, would try to do. Uh, this is very ex probably very expected. You probably didn't hear anything new from me. Uh, this, this is also general limitation which is put on the on entire computing infrastructure at Carnegie Mellon University. So Carnegie Mellon is a, is a research university, obviously. And uh, US research universities typically in their 90s were running some flavor of Solaris. That was my experience. If you were very lucky, like I was, uh, one of the faculty was doing soliton theory. So he had this beautiful IRIX, uh, I should have. Uh, he had this beautiful, do I know my password now? Uh, he had this beautiful IRIX uh, uh, workstations, uh, but it was mostly Solaris. Around 2000, you know, universities sort of start switching between, uh, from Solaris, they start switching uh, uh, either to Linux, uh, you reach universities like Stanford, they start giving their students some Mac OSs, and you had Windows at the pretty much at all lower level institutions of secondary education in the United States. You can find mostly Windows centric infrastructure. So uh, CMU is no exception. So we are a research university. Most of our desktops run Ubuntu uh, at CMU. I will be honest with you. And uh, in particular, uh, in the School of Computer Science, uh, uh, scientific lab, so we have probably a couple thousand servers uh, that are used by faculty at the physics department, meteorology, mathematics, and so, so on forth. It's mishmash of Ubuntu, Red Hat, Rocks clustering distribution stuff, but it's very hard to find uh, BSDs in general. Now, people are not ignorant about that. You know that Mac, Mac Kernel uh, started at CMU. Uh, I, I would uh, proudly say that uh, one of the guys with whom I share office, John Osland, was uh, on Athena project at MIT, uh, 1984, when a whole X Windows system started. Uh, the guy who is maintaining my MX record for my mailing list, uh, 
he uh, was helping Brian Reed uh, do Scribe. People who know something about text processing will remember Scribe from early 80s. So people are not ignorant by any, ch by any stretch of imagination. They are very competent people, uh, but it's just very rare that you find BSDs. Uh, so going further to a general limitation of any BSDs, uh, let's talk a little bit about port collection. Port collection, uh, port collection uh, in uh, both projects that I use at work, OpenBSD and FreeBSD, uh, uh, volunteering, uh, yeah, you probably read already one of the, uh, uh, actually there is something interesting on the next, uh, uh, hit and miss. And I, I don't say this in disrespectful, uh, disrespectful sense, I mean, if, if I don't have a time uh, to upgrade a port A to the certain version, why would I expect that Antoine or some, somebody else have, has more time than me? He also has a family, kids and stuff, uh, uh, you know, to work. And unfortunately, there is just too much open, soft, open software used in an academic environment to be practically possible to maintain so many ports to say, okay, we in our house, we're gonna take over and we're gonna maintain so much software. So on any given day, uh, you know, people might use Atlas Blast, LA Pack, Boost, GCC 5.0 or higher. Uh, why? Uh, scientists are typically very poor uh, coders. That's why we have a professional uh, software writers working in our lab. And uh, that means that sometimes they read that there is a uh, feature A, which is uh, just available in the very latest uh, uh, GCC version, and then I have to install very latest version of GCC. You know? And as you know, this is not trivial things. We use OpenCV, GNU Debugger, Valgrind. You know, some of these, I, I, I'm not sure that Valgrind uh, is available for, uh, for OpenBSD, for example. Uh, uh, good students, uh, once when they're well initiated, when they start doing a big data, seriously big data science, typically they move quickly from MATLAB. Uh, the most serious domain specific language used by uh, 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 machine learning students after MATLAB first uh, domain specific language is typically R. Uh, my experience with R in all BSD projects, I mean, again, I'm talking about mostly free and uh, open, was that the port is exceptionally well maintained. Uh, I believe you guys at Package Source have also exceptionally well, well maintained the po maintained port. Uh, and it, it's always, you know, uh, up to the standards. There are lots of custom small sub packages. So R comes with its own packaging management system, obviously, uh, just like Python, it comes with uh, pip install. Uh, sometimes, that can be used to install some modules. Uh, sometimes it cannot be used to install uh, modules. In particular, in my experience, you don't want even to try to install something in NumPy, SciPython uh, using uh, pip install, uh, but for some things you might want. Uh, in particular, the OpenBSD project, for example, did not have until recently 3.5 uh, flavors for the Python modules. I can say something about uh, basically 2.7 versus 3.5 uh, version of Python if people care about that. We typically, uh, or at least I typically advise people to stick with 2.7 because there is so much stuff written with 2.7 and at some point, at some point actually benefit of a nicer language of 3.5 Python which is for all practical purposes a different language just like C++ is different language than C, uh, outweighs uh, so, uh, so the cons outweighs the, pro, pro, uh, the pros of moving to 3.5. Uh, a big selling point for a Red Hat in particular, and why I actually, when I run Linux, why I run Red Hat, why I don't run Ubuntu? There are two principal reasons. One reason is actually purely political. I work for lots of uh, three-letter agencies. We have lots of grants. Uh, government grants in particular, uh, and often these agencies have some uh, regulations. 
and you have to comply with regulations. And when the guy shows up with a couple million dollars at your door, uh, you comply with regulations. You don't say, no, I'm not going to take this $2 million grant because you know, it enforces regulation A upon me. Uh, the only technical reason, I mean, it, would, it wouldn't be the only technical, uh, uh, just only technical reason, but the major technical reason that I also prefer Red Hat is that there is this rocks clustering distribution. At this very moment, I don't run a single rocks cluster. I used to run in the past rocks cluster. Uh, this is a fun fantastic thing, you know, which is completely bundled and enables you to basically put out a uh, soft cl cluster uh, fairly quickly. Uh, one of the reasons that we were running this uh, was, you probably have heard of Hadoop, right? This magic thing that can solve everything. <laughs> uh, there is also Apache Spark. And so uh, Hadoop is just uh, Apache module on the, to on the top of the ROCKS cluster. And uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, both Hadoop and Apache Spark were fi uh, finally available in the free BSD. Uh, there is, for example, no cafe. If you have not heard for cafe, you know, you're not a deep learning guy. I have not heard myself until half a year ago. It uses, uh, 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 it is particularly written for GPUs. Uh, many kids in my uh, uh, lab use, when I say kids, I ref they're half my age, but these, these are PhD students, very serious PhD students, who would be uh, leaders in many technologies companies soon. And for example, my experience with CAFE is that due to Ubuntu uh, activism, the guy is plain basically stating that he wants to break compilation of CAFE on Red Hat. I'm having a hard time compiling this on, on Red Hat, which is Linux, let alone on uh, BSDs. You know. And there are two options for compiling, where you, whether you want Atlas versus OpenBlast and stuff. So uh, many of the tiny uh, math softwares uh, I've written for Ubuntu specifically. Uh, and people don't test it. So why would I even bother with these small, tiny pieces of software? Uh, actually, the least favorite day of, of my work week is typically Friday afternoon. That's when people have some time on their hands. And then they start Googling. And they uh, stumble upon a piece of software. And uh, uh, they want. They immediately send me an email because they get excited and they want that piece of software to work for them. Uh, and the ultimate que question is, do people in academia need really such a software diversity? And the answer is not. No, we don't. Uh, but when the thesis is not going well, right, uh, the easiest thing to blame is you blame the guy who is maintaining your infrastructure, you know, because otherwise you would finish that PhD dissertation by Monday, right? Yeah. Otherwise the paper that I, you know, I'm trying to hammer for the past year with my former boss, it would be finished by Monday, but there is a magical piece of software mi missing, right? So it is, that, that is ultimately the true honest to God answer to the question about such a wide software diversity. We really don't need such a wide fo uh, software diversity. And finally, uh, these are some miscellaneous issues in limitations of BSDs. This, I'm talking across the board. I'm not pointing fingers in any specific project. I'm just saying uh, across the board. DDO compliance, Department of Defense compliance. Uh, people who are familiar with this, uh, these laws, um, they, they will know what I'm uh, uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, second thing is uh, we had to have a bunch of virtual machines. Uh, uh, there was some lack of uh, full paravilitarization like Zen DOM 0. Uh, if people poke me about NetBSD, I will say something because NetBSD had DOM 0 to my knowledge for a long time that I never really had got to try. Uh, so I, I unfortunately, I like, just like Henning, I run a bunch of key VMs on Red Hat. Red Hat. Uh, uh, we are heavy user of OS level virtualization, FreeBSD jails. I use them quite a bit on the top of ZFS pools. Uh, I really like the fact that I can take a snapshot of a, of a jail, that I can do remote replication of the jail. Uh, it would be very nice for me to have some kind of functional application virtualization. And in particular, I'm keen on only two applications. Uh, two applications 
uh, because of which uh, some of my bosses have to have a dual boot. So actually, my bosses typically don't run Windows, but they have a dual boot on Windows. Uh, those two applications is Microsoft Office. Sorry, just Open Office is, th there is something about Open Office that, and the second one is WebEx. We have lots of these conference calls, and I do not know about your experience, but I found excruciatingly difficult to get WebEx working properly on Linux. So. When we have a WebEx conference call, we fire up a Windows 7 laptop, and that's what it is. Uh, I asked here, is it too late for Beehive V? Well, three years ago, when I was evaluating what really, where I want to put my eggs, what virtualization technology I want to use, Beehive V was really not, uh, not there yet. Uh, and I'm glad I talked to some uh, I IO uh, Hy-V developers, and uh, you know, I'm glad that I made the decision because it's still not, not there. It's going to be there at 11, in 11, uh, but it's still not there. Uh, uh, developers and students' familiarity with anything besides uh, Ubuntu is a problem. Uh, I have users, you would think that everybody at Carnegie Mellon University, and when I talk about computer science students, it's super smart that they can program and stuff. Uh, uh, it's not, that's not the case. Okay, that's not the case. Uh, competence of the user is varies greatly. Uh, you have a users uh, uh, who can easily hack. Uh, probably there are some people who are submitting some patches to BSD projects or Linux projects. Uh, uh, one of German guys uh, uh, who is in the Software Institute, whom I know from Computer Club, uh, he, I think he ported uh, NetBSD to VAX originally, if I recall correctly, or something like that. Uh, so there are highly competent people. At the same time, you will find people who will send you an email and say, uh, please, can you help me out uh, set up FileZilla? File I need to move a file from my desktop to one of your servers, and uh, your SSH doesn't work. Okay, whatever, doesn't work. Uh, my experience with OSX people is also uh, mixed bag. I always think of OSX. Uh, uh, as a Unix with three fundamental design flaws, right? Uh, Launch D is the first fundamental design flaw, P list, and that XFS file system. Other than that, it's a perfectly sane Unix system. Uh, but again, you have people who are doing, who are using OSX who are fantastically competent, and you have people who are using OSX who are clicking, dropping, they're not really. Uh, last issue is, uh, is a, uh, that basically it's more problem for a system. It's high diversity of, of, the, of the hardware. And why we have, uh, again, this is behind the scene talk. So why do we have such a high diversity of the, of the, of the hardware? Uh, actually, main acquisition method for our equipment is accretion. There is no long-term planning. How do I acquire equipment? I write a grant proposal. We live on the soft money, obviously. I write a grant proposal, typically to some of the government agencies, and the government agency approves a certain amount of money uh, for purchasing a hardware pieces. Amount of money might be non-trivial, so I have a file server that costs thirty, forty thousand dollars. I spend probably a couple hundred thousand dollars every year on hardware, but uh, there is there, there, there is no systematic planning how we acquire this hardware. On the top of it, what was exceptionally annoying to me as a guy who basically liked to play with OpenBSD with network and stuff, typically, you know, government will give you uh, $25,000 for to buy that shiny file server, or they're gonna give you $50,000 to buy several computing nodes with, uh, I have computing nodes with 1.5 terabyte of RAM, actually, we have a computing nodes with three terabyte of uh, RAM that are supposed to arrive. Uh, but they're not gonna give you 300 bucks to buy uh, that Atom server that needs to run the firewall, which seems completely silly. So what we do, I, I probably should not say this because everything is recorded, so it could be used against me <laughs> in the court of law. We do a little bit creative accounting, you know, Eastern European style. <laughs> what can I say? Yeah, 
but at the end of the day, uh, uh, at the end of the day, we get job done. So this is probably so that's about a half of my talk, 30 minutes, and this is the part of the talk where I actually I would like some kind of input uh, from you. What would you really like to see uh, out of all these uh, BSD projects? Uh, what you're curious about? How do I use? And I also also have this. Uh, maybe I could show you last two slides. Uh, I have a slide uh, about dark clouds, right? And I have also a slide about my references that I probably should mention because before I run out of time, because I owe most of my knowledge actually to people who at this conference. I'm a self-taught guy. I never, you know, I was just speaking things then, uh, from the internet. And my motto was always, if I can read it, and if there is a well good documentation, that's why I like so much BSDs, then I probably can get things going. So any particular flavor? Uh, Maybe we should take a vote. Since everything else is concentrated to free BSD, how about we try NetBSD? NetBSD, very good. Uh, OK. Uh, this is uh, the link to my website. Let me see if I can do pull this magic. I should be able to pull this. I should be able to click it, and this should magically work. It's going to take a few minutes for, to, to start Firefox, right? That's my website, right? Uh, actually, my website runs NetBSD. <laughs> I'm one of the people who have this, uh, I probably have, uh, have had this account, an SDF, which is a free shell Unix account for close to 20 years. Uh, uh, another thing that I really, really, truly like about uh, NetBSD, and uh, I was I was trying to get some of uh, OpenBSD developers uh, interested in is uh, this uh, write ahead block uh, 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 file system partial with partial logs, uh, which is exceptionally good for. But in generally, a part of that, uh, we have not had much used for NetBSD. Uh, kids run it in the uh, computer club. Uh, at CMU, but I honestly did not have too much uh, use for it. Uh, one, there are two things that basically, there is one thing that I was always a little bit mysterious to me with, when it comes to NetBSD. Uh, this is a like, lack of advertising for uh, DOM0. I actually, honestly, I've, for the first time I've seen people now uh, who are NetBSD developers. I've seen, I've met people, users before, but I've never met developers. And I, it was always mysterious why they're not advertising that. I just never had, you know, uh, got. And another thing that it becomes an issue, and this is not just an issue with NetBSD because there was absolutely not a single talk about Dragonfly. And I can probably spend the rest of my talk talking about Dragonfly. The another issue that comes with the NetBSD is the issue of not just visibility, but how many people really actually use it in production? Yes, sir. So uh, that, that statement is spent in itself. I'm a NetBSD developer. I run nothing but NetBSD uh, on my IOC. I am glad to hear that I'm wrong. <laughs> Let me put it that way. I'm very glad to hear that wrong. So the, uh, you would be surprised. I, con I consider a, 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 at least myself moderately intelligent person. And sometimes even moderately intelligent person get uh, their information from various sources. One of the sources that I'm get, so there was a, a, a there was a bunch of uh, interviews last year. Some Polish guy had a bunch of online interviews with NetBSD developers, and what scared the hell out of me, the underlining issue was that you know you, you ask Henning, yeah, Henning runs, you know, his internet service provider. He runs, he eats his dog food, and then you have. Uh, Martin Heisman, and he works, and he says, yeah, you know, it, right now at the work, we were trying to put NetBSD, but we are running this and stuff. So I'm glad that I'm wrong about this. I'm glad that I'm wrong about this. Yeah, I thought it was the opposite of most of these people. I, I run NetBSD at work, and women stay home. Oh, 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 oh. oh my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Shame on you. <laughs> Shame on you. Well, it's, it's all the audio stuff. I mean, I'm an HFLDB. Shame on you. Uh, okay, so I, 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 would, I, would, I would cross that. Uh, there is an interesting bullet here about portability. Uh, I am old enough to remember 
because, as I said earlier, universities, uh, in particular scientific lab, acquire lots of uh, equipment by accretion. So in early 90s and maybe early 2000, there was a point that there was enough uh, old Unix equipment. When I say Unix equipment like Alpha Station, uh, 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 all silicon graphics and stuff, where uh, running something like NetBSD that runs uniformly across all this hardware is, was a fantastic thing. I know a person at Caltech who ran NetBSD across five different platforms just because it runs the same way. At this point, I, I, I hope I'm wrong again, but it feels from, the, from, from my seat, uh, it feels that everything except AMD64, ARM, and MIP64 uh, is dead. Actually, there is a talk right now about risk 5 right? I hope that that's going to be true. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So uh, I, 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 have, I wanted to use very much ARM uh, for my home network, but I, even at my home network, I use Atom processor. I don't use. And my understanding with MIP64, uh, I know that FreeBSD runs well, but these are mostly proprietary network equipment, network boards and stuff. That's a MIP64. So that's my experience with NetBSD. Any other BSDs that you want to see? Yes. Okay, so uh, you asked me firstly about internals, internals of the Dragonfly. Uh, I am a mathematician, so I'm not developers. I can speak very little about internals, but I could say something about uh, Hammer, comparing a little bit to ZFS. I thought that that would be exceptional, uh, exceptionally interesting to people. And the issues that you as a system admin, who actually is not Dragonfly developer, uh, my encounter. So Dragonfly is, was forked from, if I recall correctly, from the FreeBSD 4.8. It has a completely novel messaging protocol, right? Uh, so for practical purposes, completely different kernel. It has this fancy file system called Hammer uh, that uh, works. Few other things, uh, I, I do not know if you're familiar with virtual kernels, so it's possible to run virtual kernels in full in the user list. But this is not the level on which I would think as, as, a, as a user, right? So I, as a user, I have a bunch of data and I need to store this bunch of data, that huge amount of data. So I evaluated Dragonfly for my main file server. And evaluation went something along the following line. Uh, first thing is Hammer is uh, a file system. It's not a volume manager. So in order to achieve some kind of redundancy, you either need to use a software aid or you need to use the hardware aid. At that time, I had experience with both. Uh, I actually like hardware aid. I actually like hardware aid. I had some Navy server that had to run at that time uh, uh, Linux, Red Hat Linux. I had LSI cards. They work beautifully. I had that hard drive. Uh, uh, alerting work, worked it perfectly. Uh, hot swap, everything. Uh, in Dragonfly, uh, most, most of the uh, support for the RAID cards, LSI and, and Areco in particular, those are, and those are, those are not cheap RAID cards, let's, let's put honestly. These, we are talking about equipment that in the United States can be acquired for about $750, versus, probably in Europe it's around $1,000, uh, versus host bust adapter. So if, you, if you're going with a, uh, with a ZFS host bust adapter, you can buy on eBay, essentially for about $100. So uh, most, of, uh, most of the stuff actually comes from B uh, free BSD. I am not 100% sure how well tested is that. That was uh, in, the terms of, uh, in the terms of how many people really use in the production. But that was not actually the reason that I could not use the hammer on my main, as my uh, main file server. Original reason is far more ridiculous. You probably went to Michael Lucas' uh, PAM talk. Uh, uh, since, I, since my kids are now into this Harry Potter thing, you know, that is the closest thing I've ever come to the witchcraft. Touch PAM, yes. That is the closest thing I ever came to the witchcraft. 
Uh, and uh, PEM did not work at all when I was playing with the dragonfly. Eventually, it started working at four point something. You can see my email. I got uh, dragonfly to uh, basically uh, uh, authenticate against my LDAP server. I, I use uh, LDAP server from the base of OpenBSD. I use that very simple uh, LDAP. Uh, so that was, that was basically a tipping point why I cannot use Hammer on as my main file server. Then I said, OK, if nothing else, I'm going to use uh, Hammer and Dragonfly in particular. I love it so much. You know. So some decisions you know, in system administration are technically based. You, know, you, know, you have some uh, emotionally based decisions, and then you have flip of the coins. Right? Somebody said, you know, in some cases, we just flip the coin, random coin. Uh, so I said, let me use to back up my desktops. So my desktops uh, at CMU, as I said, I'm treating uh, the, the network, CMU network as a hostile. So if, if you're my developer, some, you have a desktop which is permanently connected with OpenVPN uh, to my essentially firewall. There is some kind of redundancy step. Failover is not non-trivial with OpenVPN. So th th there is definitely, if the system goes down, there is a definitely a few minutes of downtown, but that actually that doesn't happen very often. I had uptown up times close to a year and stuff. Uh, so the way that I back up these desktops, I actually have a remote snapshot. Uh, uh, I have a remote snapshot on one of the servers. And remote snapshot, which is a glorified rsync, uh, which is a glorified rsync, pulls it, uh, essentially runs rsync here and just synchronizes desktops. So I have a full, uh, full backup of the home directories from, from, from des des desktops. Uh, that particular machine ran uh, Dragonfly for a number of months. Uh, the first problem that in, in, in was encountered was I like to use uh, SSH guard on my package filter uh, beside the building uh, protection for the brute force attacks. And I, I do filter everything ingress, egress. I actually filter on the virtual uh, interface. So it's not like if you're on my open VPN that you can do whatever you want. No, I, basically, I, I have a very tight policies. So that machine was also running package filter, that backup server. And uh, due to some bug, the way that package filter was ported to Dragonfly that was immediately fixed by Matt, uh, I had a, basically a daemon generating a log file, altering the state of log file. Uh, there was not much data generated, relatively minor. There was about maybe one gigabyte, maybe one, two gigabyte of data generated in about day, day and a half. Uh, it's not too much, right? Well, I looked at my file server, right? I looked at that backup server. Actually, the root partition was completely full because you have this fine grain history, right? So every time when the log file updates, it creates metadata, metadata, metadata. I actually ran out of space. You know, so then I learned you, you, you really have to know a little bit more to, to run this thing, to run these things. Uh, uh, but that was not enough to, dis, uh, to, to disume me from using uh, Dragonfly for that back particular backup server. Uh, what was the tipping point is in the system administration, I swear by my backups and my monitoring tools. And there are three, three kinds of monitoring tools that, that everybody, I think every same system admin administrator should de deploy. You have to have a functional monitoring so you have to have a system which will give you quick up and down view whether things work. You have to have some kind of metric collection. Uh, if you ask me, I can tell you. Functional monitoring, we use Monit Daemon, which is trivially stupid, but it works for my needs. It scales poorly, but I don't have that many servers. You have to have uh, so some kind of metric monitoring. You have some need to have some kind of remote telemetry. In my case, uh, remote telemetry consists of the combinations of SMTP daemons and uh, collect D. I really like collect D. And then uh, thirdly, you have to have a centralized logging server. And actually, logging is very important. And 
uh, one of my classmates works for Splunk. He's actually very credible probabilities. Actually going through the log files, okay, one thing is you collect the log files, but you have to do something with them. That's a very important thing. Why I'm saying these three things uh, when, I, when I'm uh, talking about Dragonfly. Some of these tools did not work for me on the Dragonfly. And the way that basically, I do not know how you operate, but in my case, if I opt for the Monit, and Monit client, which is open source client, but donated by a particular company, if it doesn't compile on the Dragonfly, that's a problem. And I can ask on their mailing list to port it, but I am not gonna uh, change my monitoring tool because it's not supporting my uh, uh, operating system of a day. Uh, collect D uh, port is broken since uh, uh, 2008 or 2009 on the Dragonfly. It does not compile. I had a hard time getting, uh, uh, pu basically pulling thing with SM SMTP. Uh, so Dragonfly, uh, uh, so the, the, uh, I, I was able to get a version one. The reason I, 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 I stop and start thinking for, for a second is because OpenBSD has its own version of SMTP uh, demo, which works as a, uh, uh, as a charm. Uh, FreeBSD has its own, but FreeNAS is moving to net uh, SNMTP, right? You, you guys are moving to, to net, net this net version, uh, at least in the FreeNAS and PCBSD. Uh, you know, so this thing did not work for me. So that is another thing. And uh, then on the mailing list, there was not enough critical mass of the people who are in the same shoes with me so that we can share some burden. You, you can basically. So that basically killed, uh, killed uh, the Dragonfly as operating system uh, in, in my business environment. I run it at home. I could uh, say something about It is a true alternative to, oops. So it is a true alternative to, to ZFS. Uh, uh, it is a true alternative to, to ZFS and has, at least in one area, it has a really real edge. So when we talk about backup, uh, I don't think of a backup as, as one, uh, a uh, single body, body. For me, uh, uh, the issue of backups consists of the three things. Uh, you, can ar you can do archiving. Archiving is when you have a bunch of data that you just store and you hope never to, uh, to use it ever again in life. Uh, School of Computer Science has a tapes from 30, 40 years ago with emails of the faculty here. And nonsense like that. So that's archiving. Uh, an example of online archiving would be uh, uh, Amazon Glazer, right? Uh, Gla something like that. You have honest to God backups. This is when I back up my file server. I'm remotely replicating to a remote server. And then you have this, what, which I incorrectly refer as a journaling, because journaling means something else in, in the terms of the file system. And journaling is, for me, is a, just a, a built-in version control. So. Hammer and ZFS, Hammer in particular, allows it to spoil your users. I can do demos if I run out of time that you see. In, in the sense that you alter the file, you alter the file or you accidentally delete the file and the user comes back after you and say, hey, you know what, I was hacking this and uh, my dissertation just disappeared. Can you recover? Yes, I can recover. Your dissertation from the, either from the ZFS snapshot or from the a hammer, hammer has both snapshots and a hammer history. Hammer history is a very fine grain journal. Snapshots are used a little bit diff differently than the snapshots in Z ZFS. Uh, it does uh, have a, a mirroring stream, which takes, has a lag about 30 seconds. It takes for me uh, to mirror st stream things from one drive to another drive, at least on my home, uh, you know. So th these, are, these are fantastic things. Uh, it works. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me see if I forgot something about Dragonfly. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I did forget a few other things. So uh, unfortunately, jail infrastructure, there is an interesting discussion, has not been upgrade, uh, updated for a very long time in the hammer. 
So if you're, gonna, if you're thinking that you're going to take advantage over the hammer in conjunction with the jails on, on the dragonfly, that's, uh, that's not, uh, uh, that's not my ex at least my experience. I, did, I was not able to use the jails in the same fashion that I was able to use on the free BSD with, the, uh, with IO cage. Uh, it still that has uh, some bugs. Uh, Tomohiro Kusumi, who keeps threatening that he's going to port Hammer 1 to both FreeBSD and OpenBSD, he has, has this statement. He's an interesting Japanese developer. He actually fixed lots of, uh, uh, lots of bugs. So there are, even after six, seven years of production, there are bugs. And I'm guessing if many of you suddenly start using Hammer and start putting, you know, half the petabyte of the data, blah, blah, this or that, that, that bugs will be discovered. Uh, uh, and as I said, uh, small user base, this is an, an example when the small user base, you, you start asking your questions, how small user base is, is, small, uh, is, is too small to enable you effectively uh, to run things. As I, as I said, I do run, it, uh, I do run uh, Dragonfly at home. This machine is running Dragonfly. Uh, and I actually keep the most precious uh, data uh, on that machine pictures and movies of my children. So I trust pictures and movies of, of my children with the, with the hammer one. Okay, that's, that's absolutely the most valuable data in my life. I actually do two things uh, with this. So uh, hammer is fully network aware. So I have export here with NFS to my OpenBSD desktop. Uh, it is a fully history aware. So if you log into your uh, Dragonfly box, you can pull the history of that file. Uh, uh, there are client, uh, so Dragonfly opted uh, to stay on the version three of NFS. They have their own implementation of the server, which I found ve very fast and reliable. Uh, with a little bit tweaking on OpenBSD uh, NFS client side, which, uh, which has this reputation of being very slow, with a little bit tweaking, actually I was uh, obtaining the speeds of about 80 megabits per second of, of write and, and read over a gigabit of, of network. On the top of it, uh, I have some directory here that I back up on Dragonfly using a remote snapshot. And it's interesting because if you analyze the, if you analyze how the R snapshot was using through the history uh, to back up the things, uh, Hammer actually an, uh, allows you to use it in the most original uh, uh, in, in, in intended way. So originally, uh, people were just R snapshotting their things to a remote lo location. Now, the way that R snapshot works in, in, the, in the default mode is that it snapshot the things, but it does not delete previous copy before, uh, before the full copy is, is committed, right? Uh, which basically means that you don't have any historical evidence and stuff. So people came up with the clever scripts, then R snapshot is more clever script. Well, there is a switch in R snapshot, which enables you to essentially copy the things all on the top of existing things. Now, that thing would be extremely dangerous to use on anything else but on Hammer. Because when you use R snapshot with a Hammer in that fashion, what it happens, for, first off, Hammer has built-in checksums. You know, uh, and data integrity tools. And then uh, essentially you just, uh, because you're copying on the top of it, you're essentially modifying file and enables you that you pu pull out the older versions of your file from the hammer history. Yeah. Any other? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, we can look PFSense. I'm open BSD guy, right? So I don't use PFSense. But I like to see what people uh, do. Uh, I'm very curious to see what people do. Uh, PFSense is, in my point of view, so uh, unlike Linux, uh, free we, 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 we don't have this distribution nonsense and stuff. We have either operating system or we have turnkey appliances. PFSense is an moderately, at least for me, interested turnkey network appliances. And Mike Lucas said if people are uh, nerd type, he would suggest OpenBSD. If they're not turned 
another type, he would suggest PF sense. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the long history of PF on, uh, PF sense on FreeBSDs, a uh, uh, few other things. So first interesting thing about, uh, about FreeNAS and PF sense for me personally was that was my entry point to embedded, uh, embedded installation. So I learned about NanoBSD and FreeBSD, and I learned about Flush RD, that's uh, OpenBSD version, essentially playing with PF sense and FreeNAS. Uh, uh, I'm not a big fan of web server configuration t t tools, but I was very curious. Uh, I run it in VirtualBox. I was very curious what PFSense people use uh, for monitoring, for backups. I was reading very carefully configuration files uh, and trying to, to understand what is it. And one can learn a lot from, from seeing people who are in the similar shoes who like to, to use that. Uh, who, who using similar things. Uh, one very interesting feature to me personally was that PFSense has this built-in captivate uh, 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 portal. Uh, I've seen, I've never implemented that on OpenBSD. I have played with OutPF on OpenBSD. I don't think it's practical if, if, if I was in the shoes. So if I was running a small business and I need to provide wireless in, in a hotel, I do not know how would they do that, you know. PFSense can do this off the shell. Uh, what else can I say? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, is, is, any, is any turnkey appliance to, you can say always at least, this is my, my personal opinion, you can, you can say uh, two obvious things. Uh, a typical turnkey appliance like FreeNAS, uh, PFSense, uh, will be a good starting point it basically is going to uh, help you get into the things quicker. Uh, typically, it has way too many features. You always, your PFSense caters to people who have different needs. So typically, it would implement more things that you want to use, uh, which might not be a problem at the beginning, but you know, eventually. And thirdly, a uh, couple years down the line, you will find yourself, uh, you will find yourself that you want to tweak uh, something on the way that uh, it is not intended to be tweaked. You know, I didn't do that with PFSense because I don't deploy in production, but I've done that with FreeNAS, where I have two FreeNAS servers, and a couple years down the line, I want to do something a little bit different, and that's a hell of a difficult thing to do, and it's basically two-minute thing on the, uh, you know. Is it a good thing? I think it's a fantastic thing for a community. Uh, I, uh, uh, I actually, uh, have a very high regard about their hardware. They have a fantastic hardware taste. Tip, my typical way to acquire network hardware is to, to go on their website and to see what they're suggesting. Are, are you affiliated to PFSense? No. No, yes, 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 yes. So that, uh, but as I said, uh, at the point when I was in, in the shoes with system, I, I, I had the, over 10 years, uh, uh, experience with OpenBSD and to me, uh, to me editing uh, pf.conf is sort of second nature, you know, setting up OpenVPN and stuff, it's sort of, I, I honestly don't need a, need, need a good, but I, I think it's a fantastic project. I think it's a fantastic thing. Anything else? I think we are running slowly out of time. Yes, sir. That's fantastic. Yeah. For, for people who are not familiar with OutPF, OutPF is this piece of code where essentially you pull SSH client, you do a fake SSH to a to a to a gate, and which essentially alters the firewall rules and enables you to use the internet. But So I think I have to wrap up, uh, wrap up this uh, 
session, but if, you, if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. Also, if people want to see a uh, few things uh, on, on the computer, I would be happy to demonstrate after the talk to, to demonstrate how you pull the things from the history and stuff. Please. No, I did not. Uh, I did not. Uh, the very, I will, you're also pondering on an interesting question. Uh, if you think that we have a problem at university setting in the United States acquiring hardware and basically billing uh, our uh, people who are giving us grant money for hardware, uh, with software is 10 times worse. With software is 10 times worse. So, uh, I get my MATLAB license uh, through Carnegie Mellon's uh, School of Computer Science. But it, it will be very, very difficult for me, uh, essentially, to walk into my boss office and to say, do we have 500 bucks, 200 bucks to acquire a piece of software? So we tend to gravitate, uh, we tend to, gravitate uh, to open source, uh, source software and to use mostly open source software, unless it's mandated, as, again, by three, three letters government agencies. So, uh, I'm going to pull out another slide. Yeah, I'm going to pull out about these dark clouds if people have, you know, the scariest thing, uh, the talk is over so if people want to leave. I, I, the scariest thing that is happening more recently to me is that uh, we get a grant from a big government agency and they ask us to do job, blah, 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 this. And sometimes we also deliver a piece of code. Uh, as a par part of the grant. This might be an analytical tool. Time sometimes we deliver whole systems. I, I just cannot talk about what. Uh, on a couple occasions, more recently, uh, we get this request that we deliver something in the Docker, which made my stomach, you know. So deliverables in the Docker. So th there is this uh, issue of, of a dark clouds. You know, I was, in, I was in DC on some conference with a bunch of this uh, government guys, and they say, oh, we have a Docker, we have this. And I said, well, uh, not to be BSD partial, but I said Solaris had zones and crossbow for about 20 years. So what about that? Oh, that was too complicated. I said, okay, whatever. Yeah, so. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs> Sorry? Just what? Oh, actually, I am running, uh, I, so uh, I'm, I actually prefer True OS over the, over the vanilla FreeBSD installation. I can say two, yes. So there is, so this is a typical question that people ask. They say, I'm a long time FreeBSD user stand, uh, starting out with True OS. Is there a cheat sheet documentation that separates True OS from the vanilla FreeBSD? That, that is the question that people ask, okay? And there is a bunch of the things. So the first thing, uh, TrueOS uses this PCB installer. I'm, I, I don't care for GUI. Why I liked it is because uh, you could have installed uh, FreeBSD on the mirror, uh, Z mirror, before that was possible with, uh, uh, w with actually vanilla FreeBSD. So I have some installations where basically my operating system uh, is on the ZFS mirror. The second thing is that for a long time they were championing this BI admin, which, what's BI admin? You take a snapshot before the upgrade, and then uh, you, you basically, when you're booting, you can select graphically which boot environment, and this is not grab boot loader. So it, it, this is a full operating system, so this is not a Linux nonsense. But also enables you that if everything goes well, you can actually mark certain uh, snapshots as active and then reboot remotely, reboot your machine into that. That works as a chart. Uh, they had update manager, I believe, a little bit before the update manager worked as a charming uh, in FreeBSD. 
Life Preserver was well advertised. I hit some bugs. I'm not using Life Preserver. I'm not going to lie to you. I use, actually, I emailed to your, your, your brother about those. Uh, uh, and uh, I use SFS Snap for Snapshot and X Wrapper. Uh, they had Varden. Uh, I use IO Cage. Uh, so that doesn't stop. Uh, I wrote here, they have saner defaults. So obviously, based upon my talk now, you know that I'm not expert in anything. Uh, so I, I would think that when I deploy operating system, I actually l like when it has a very sane default because I'm, I'm counting that people who, who have done something like OpenBSD network, they know more about the network, about the setup than I. So uh, they had, for example, very sane defaults with the periodic script. Now, one thing that never worked for me on the true OS, uh, as I said, the closest I ever come to witchcraft is uh, Palm Wizardry. Uh, LDAP works perfectly with FreeNAS. I had a very hard time with, with LDAP on, on the true OS. Very hard time. And, 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 and there are these magical files, pcbsd.conf, pcl, that was just scary. But yes, uh, actually, I, I run true OS instead of vanilla FreeBSD. 